Thanks very much, Greta. Uh, I'd like to really thank um, Dave and, of course, also um, Saul and Bill for making this happen. Um, some of you may know that actually the really the, the concept that has dominated my thinking and my activities over the past nine years was first born in this very hotel at the first Manhattan Beach Project meeting run by Dave um, right here in the summer of 2000. So I'll go on to that in due course. Now, um, Dave asked me to give two talks. And so first of all, Greta, before you... Greta, pay attention. Um, how long do I actually have total? Ten minutes for Q&A. And then for the second talk? Oh, oh you have, yeah, I'm yeah, you have uh, two different talks. Right. They're both the same. Oh, so I, have 20 for, so I have a total of an hour, including questions, you're saying? Are you trying to give both your talks now? Yeah, it went back to back. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, no, I'm sorry, Harvey. No, you have 30 minutes combined plus 10 Q&A. Okay, total of 40 minutes. All right, right. great. Marvelous. All right, then. So I'm actually, in, in practice, I'm actually going to give three talks, but I will get them into 40 minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, so, so first of all, I'm going to talk about a couple of aspects of ageing that haven't yet um, received much attention over this morning. Um, and then I'm going to give a more of a, if you like, an, an all-embracing overview um, of how I see it all fits together. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about the mitochondria, and in particular about the mitochondrial DNA. Um, some of you probably know that not all of our DNA... Is this working? Um, how do I make this work? Let me try going backwards. No, that didn't work either. How do I make this work? Sorry? Ah, oh, I'm using the wrong one. That would do it. Yep, great. All right, so some of you probably know that not all of our DNA is in our 23 chromosomes that have those horrible telomere things on the end that we've heard so much about today. Some of it is in a special part of the cell called the mitochondrion. And nearly all of our cells have mitochondria, um, typically between uh, hundreds or thousands of them. And each of those mitochondria has one or more, usually a few, of these things which is a circular chunk of DNA, only 16,500 base pairs long, um, that encodes 13 proteins. There are, there are 13 genes here that encode proteins. There are also a bunch of genes that encode RNAs involved in the construction of those proteins, but there's nothing else, just those proteins. Um, so, um, here's some interesting questions. First of all, we know that the DNA in, the chromo in our chromosomes in the nucleus accumulates damage, accumulates mutations and such like. And Robert Bradbury is going to be talking more about that later. Um, it also, of course, accumulates telomere shortening. Telomere shortening doesn't happen in the mitochondrial DNA because it's circular and so it doesn't have any ends. But the mutations certainly do happen in the mitochondrial DNA. Um, interestingly, they accumulate non-uniformly across tissue. We see a lot of them in a few cells and almost none of them in the rest of our cells, which is pretty interesting. Um, big question comes up, does this matter? Does this actually contribute to age-related ill health late in life? And that's still a really controversial question within the study of the biology of ageing. I think it probably does, but it's not clear because, as I said, only a few cells are actually significantly affected by the accumulation of this problem. Um, so chances are that it does matter. There's lots of circum circumstantial evidence that it matters, but probably only by rather interesting and elaborate pathways. All right, so that's not meant to be there. Take that away. Um, all right, so um, now the, I've told you that the mitochondrial DNA is really simple. It only encodes these 13 proteins. But the mitochondria themselves are actually not simple at all. There's more than 1,000 different proteins in a mitochondrion. And the reason why this is possible is because the mitochondrion also uh, includes lots of proteins that are encoded in the nucleus, like the rest of our proteins. So they are constructed in the normal way that any other protein is constructed. A, RNA, a messenger RNA is created by transcription. It's exported from the nucleus into the main part of the cell, the cytosol. Uh, and there it's um, translated. The protein that it encodes is co constructed. And then that protein is imported into the mitochondrion like this. Okay, and as I say, there are these 13 proteins for which none of that happens because it all happens inside the mitochondrion. All right, so there are some interesting facts here. As I've said here, 99%, that, that's you know, more than 1,000 relative to only 13 proteins are there, um, including the proteins, most of the proteins involved in a process called oxidative phosphorylation, which is, the, which is one of the things the mitochondria do, and it's certainly the best known. It's basically the chemistry of breathing, the way in which energy is extracted from nutrients by, create, by, by taking electrons out of nutrient molecules like sugars and fats and 
giving them and transferring them to oxygen to make um, water and in the process also make carbon dioxide. Um, now, this fact is rather important and interesting. It turns out that mutations accumulate much, much faster in the mitochondrial DNA than they do in the nuclear DNA. So it's really a rather bad thing that there are these 13 important proteins that are in the wrong place, so to speak. Now, we know a lot about that process I mentioned earlier about the import of proteins. Um, and furthermore, this is an important fact, it turns out that the type of mutations that accumulate in the mitochondrial DNA during normal aging tend to be ones that completely eliminate all 13 of these proteins from being made. This is rather unusual relative to how things are in the nuclear DNA, where we often see mutations that just modify the one or two proteins here and there. I won't go into details about what goes on, but essentially this is the case. Almost all, protein, almost all mutations just knock out the construction of all of these proteins. So, if we want to do something about this, if we decide, well, we don't know for certain that mitochondrial mutations are important in aging, but it looks as though they probably are, if we want to do something about it, there are various possibilities out there. This seems to be the most realistic as things currently stand. The uh, mitochondrial DNA is DNA, after all. It's, the, it's, it's turned into proteins in very much the same way as we have in the nucleus. Um, so maybe we can actually modify those genes in such a way that we could put them into the nucleus and then the proteins would be constructed in the cytosol, in the main body of the cell, but the modifications that we had made to the genes would be such that those proteins would then be imported into the mitochondria, just like the thousand other ones that already are, naturally, and then we wouldn't have a problem with mutations. We wouldn't need to fix the mutations. The mutations could still accumulate in the mitochondria, but they wouldn't matter because they eliminate the synthesis of the proteins and the proteins are coming in from elsewhere, from the outside of the mitochondria. So the machinery for doing this thing, oxidative phosphorylation, will still be constructed with proper, normal, non-mutant proteins in the normal way. The glorious thing about this approach is that it sidesteps all of the enormous amount that we don't know, all of our enormous ignorance about how these proteins actually work. There's an awful lot still not known about how the individual components of the oxidative phosphorylation machinery actually function. What the biggest component of that machinery, something called complex one, hasn't even been crystallized yet. So this is the basic idea. We, this is the, what, what I showed you earlier, where most proteins are imported after being synthesized out in the cytosol, and you've got these 13 being made this way. What we can do is the molecular biology. We can just take this DNA, we can modify the genes, put the genes into the nucleus, such that this all happens with those 13 as well as with the others. All right, so what's, what's the situation been in terms of progress? Well, this concept is by no means my idea. It was first discussed and experimented with in the mid-1980s, and things went awfully well at first. One particular protein, which happens to be very small, um, was relocated in this way. Allotopic expression was done in yeast, and it worked pretty much first time. It only took a couple of years for this group in Australia to make the thing actually work properly and rescue a mutation in the relevant gene in the mitochondrion. In other words, the, the yeast could breathe perfectly normally, could do all of the um, chemistry of breathing, uh, despite the fact that it had no ability for its mitochondria to actually create this gene, this protein. Unfortunately, after that, things started going rather more poorly. Uh, the next gene that they tried, the same group, actually, same, same research group, uh, couldn't get it to work. They moved the gene, but they couldn't get the gene to actually function properly. Um, and lots of people essentially lost hope after that. There was enormous interest in this for a few years around here, but that interest waned as people hit problems and couldn't get the thing to work, especially not in mammalian cells. An absolute hero named Steve Zulo succeeded in 2000 after an enormous amount of persist perseverance and basically a bit of luck being able to essentially do a lot of work in, in a lab where he wasn't really being paid, um, he got one gene to work. And that was a major breakthrough. Here is a graph from the paper that he published in this, uh, about this. And essentially what's happening here is these two uh, dark lines up here are control situations where you've got cells being grown in a medium that allows them to grow even if they can't do oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the um, set of cells that do not have the trans trans 
preferred gene in their nuclear DNA and also the ones that do, then this line here that trails off and becomes horizontal, in other words, growth of the cells stops, is cells which do not have the, trans, the, the transgene, the gene that has been modified and put into the nucleus, and they are being grown in medium where they do need to do oxidative phosphorylation in order to grow. Okay, so as you can see, they grow for a little while and then they just stop growing. The important line is this one here, which is cells being grown in that non-permissive medium where they can't grow unless they can do oxidative phosphorylation, but they've got this tr transferred gene. And as you can see, they're doing fine. They take a little while to take off, and we think we know why that is. Um, but once they do take off, they grow almost as well as cells that are being grown in the permissive medium. So that was a massive breakthrough. 